Hello and welcome to the Catch a Lift Coaches Corner. I'm Cal Coach and Program Director Melissa, and this week I'm honored to welcome retired U.S. Army veteran Mitchell Hockenberry to the show. Mitchell is a retired U.S. Army veteran. He served time in the U.S. Marine Corps and currently is a financial planner. Welcome to this week's episode of the Coach's Corner. Mitchell, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We're excited to talk to you. Let's jump right in. Mitch, would you talk to us a little bit about your life growing up and what would ultimately drive you to join the Marines? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, Probably like a lot of people, I kind of have this thing, you know, I, I don't have data to back it up, but I think when you join the military, you come from either a broken home or a poor home. And I came from both. Uh, so we didn't have a whole lot when we were growing up. Um, but one thing that we did have is a, a little bit of a military background, um, some history in the family. My, my, fa- my grandfather, excuse me, had fought uh, World War II. Uh, my brother, uh, which was a big influence on me, he's about nine years older. He had enlisted in the Marine Corps, um, and that kind of that plus my father went to school with a guy that in Vietnam in the Marine Corps was awarded the Medal of Honor, and that was like a really well, obviously it's a big deal. But in the town that he was from, he was kind of a smaller town, uh, Winslow, Arizona, um, so standing on the corner. Um, he, uh, I mean, that was a huge deal for that for that town, and so yeah, that was I'm always sure. this thing was the Marine Corps is, is, is it man. And so I really wanted to go to college. No one had ever been to college in my family. Um, but we didn't have anything. And so, you know, to get me there. And, um, so my dad was always like, Hey, if you want to go to college, son, you got to go in the Marine Corps. Um, not any other branch. I don't know why, but just the Marine Corps. So (laughs) as though that was the only one that GI Bill worked for. Um, but, uh, so that's what I did. I went, uh, I mean, I knew, I knew from, from a, a young age, that's how I was going to go. So I could get that GI bill and then go uh, to college and move on from there. That's incredible. Mitch, talk to us a little bit about what you remember most about training up as a young Marine. Yeah. So um, I, I forgot to say this too. My, my uncle had retired from the Marine Corps as a master gunnery sergeant. Uh, so I remember going into it, you know, my brother had given me all these stories and then um, I had my uncle who really didn't talk a whole lot about it. He was kind of one of those Vietnam vets that was like, you know, you just never got anything out of them unless they were, you know, heavily intoxicated. <laughs> um, but uh, between those two, really, I felt like I knew everything that was going to happen in boot camp. I just didn't know how I was going to respond to what was going to happen. Right, um, right. But what I can tell you yeah, what I could tell you is um, I ended up going with two other guys. I kind of, not that I recruited them, but two other guys from my high school that were great friends of mine. We all went in on the buddy program together. And um, I loved boot camp. It was, it was to me, it was funny. There were so many things that would happen. Like, I mean, and, and not only that, but I think every day in the military, there's something funny that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> I was called the good time recruit because it, some, if, if you heard laughter, it was probably from me, um, <laughs> just off of something that somebody would do, right? Whether they yeah. fell, tripped, you know, uh, whatever it may be. But um, yeah, so I was doing a lot of push-ups on the quarter deck because I would <laughs> giggle from time to time. That's incredible. How long were you in the Marines, Mitch? Uh, I did my four years and then got out, uh, went to college uh, right after that. So I was a, I was a military police um, field MP, so a little bit different than baseline, which is the ones with the badges and standing there, you know, writing tickets. Um, we were the ones in the Humvees kind of doing convoy security and, and that kind of stuff. Um, okay. But so I did, my, I did my four years and then got out uh, so that I could go to college um, right after that. Wonderful. So what would, what would happen after you got out of the Marine Corps, Mitch? Yeah. Um, straight into, straight to college. Um, I actually got out like, like they gave me like a 30 day early out for education. Um, so I got out, uh, went straight in to the university of Nebraska, Omaha, um, to get a, I ended up double majoring. I got a finance and accounting or finance and banking with a minor in accounting degree. Um, and I put myself through school. I mean, the GI bill was just enough to kind of pay for, for the yeah. basics, um, of, of tuition, uh, but still had to, still had to live. Right. So I ended up going to work for an online brokerage firm. Um, 
Well, actually, to throw a little interesting tidpoint, tid, tid, whatever, <laughs> extra little thing there, I, I did a little stint as a private investigator for a little while. Um, but really? But when I wanted to get serious and start to kind of move and, yeah, so when I wanted, yeah, happy to talk about that too. Um, but uh, I moved into the financial services industry, and so that's when I went to work for an online brokerage firm. Um, and then following that, I went full service once I, uh, graduated. Um, and then nine 11 kind of came along and it was like, I had that pull of like, I need to go back in. Um, I hadn't done anything quote, you know, unquote right. with the, um, server between the two Gulf wars. And so I felt like there was something that I still had to, to give, um, that I would be able to be of use and, um, yeah. So, but, but yeah, that little break in there was, was specifically college related, Okay. but it was an eight year break. I mean, it was quite some time. So it was yeah, college that's, plus a few years in the corporate That's a world. good, a good amount of time to be out of the military in, in that civilian, in that corporate sector that you were working in. Um, so there was a pull when nine 11 happened to come back in. What was it like for you coming back into the army? What did that look like, Mitch? Yeah. Um, well, I tried to go back in the Marine Corps. Um, the recruiter, I called them up and they said I was, they literally quote, you're too old and too fat. Uh, so I called up and they, they would make me, they said, we will take you back in because I wanted to go as an officer. And then they told me, um, I mean, I was 30. So, uh, I, they were just like, Hey, we'll make you a PFC again. And I was like a PFC, like that's yeah. quite the demotion. Uh, but you don't have to go to boot camp. Oh, that's a that's quite the that's quite the incentive. Yeah. Uh, so I called up the army, and it was almost like, "Are you serious? You really want to come?" Uh, and so we'll make you a second lieutenant. Uh, and so coming back in, though, there was there's a couple things that were interesting. Um, the first is we the the first is there's a completely different culture between those two, between the Marine Corps and the Army. Um, and I think there's a lot that we I think people kind of under, so former Marines intuitively know it. Everybody else kind of thinks they know it, but when you really come and see it, like it's, it's, it's really strange, like um, all the way down. To, yeah. I mean, it's just strange. People kind of get in clicks in the army, right. whereas in the Marine Corps, you can't because there's so few of you. But, but beyond that part of the culture, what's really almost mind boggling. And it went through my entire, cause I, you know, I retired army through my entire 16 years in the, in the army, it was baffling to me how little the NCOs are used comparatively to the Marine Corps, because as a PFC, you had an actual job in the Marine Corps in the army you didn't get a lot of responsibility right. until you were an E5. And that was, that was mind boggling to me. And like when I came in as a, and when I took over as a platoon leader, um, that changed. I mean, my platoon, I was like, Oh heck no, we're going to do this Marine Corps stuff. I mean, and say that, but yeah, I would just be right. like, you, your job is to be an expert in your job, learn the next job. And that came and paid dividends when guys, you know, had to get transferred out for whatever it may be, right? So different roles. I'm sure. Um, going into war, we weren't at 100%. Yeah. So it was like we had guys that had to step up and do, a, do the next man's job. And so that was, that was a really, um, in hindsight, it was great, right? Like I wouldn't have known that if I would have just come and done the status quo. I wouldn't have right. known that. Um, and so that was, that was good. The other thing that was really, really good um, is, is I had that background of being enlisted. So I knew what it was like to burn poop. I knew what it was like to police call, you know, cigarette butts when you're yep. not a smoker. <laughs> like right. I knew all yep. those things that just suck, um, about embracing the suck. And so that really helped. Um, and then the other thing was that's a good and a bad is I had eight years on my peers. And so there's a little bit of wisdom that comes in that eight years. For um, sure. The bad being like most of my bosses were younger than me, which is always weird. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of an interesting change. But the culture certainly is different between those two. And um, but the opportunities are, you know, multiples better in the Army than they are in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Thank you for talking to us a little bit about that, the cultural differences like that just in the Army and Marine Corps. That's, that's really fascinating. 
So, you know, you already touched on it already. You know, you'd go on, you would become, you know, a platoon leader. You would deploy yep. as a platoon leader the first time to Iraq. Let's talk about that deployment, Mitch. Sure. Yeah, probably the, um, yeah, probably the single um, uh, most important defining, whatever you want to call it, like whatever kind of adjectives we could throw at it. Um, was that deployment. It was part of the surge. So it was a 15 month deployment. Um, and it was, uh, it was crazy. So you're talking going in, in, in late 07. Um, and we were prepped to go to Baghdad and had done all of our studying, you know, up on the actual AO prior to going in there. So right. weekly, you know, visits to the skiff to kind of get those intel reports and start reading about it and understand the neighborhood that we're going to be in and all that stuff. Reading report, you know, reading the the the, the patrol reports, um, and then we flew into Kuwait like everybody does. We receive all of our equipment the night before we go and fly into Baghdad. There's a change of mission for our battalion, so the brigade still went there. But what had happened was um, most of Al Qaeda had packed up and left Baghdad and gone to Mosul. And so they were calling it, you know, Al Qaeda's last stand. And in that, it was um, uh, uh, another unit um, that was just kind of getting their butt handed to them because of just their size. They weren't equipped to take on this mass inflow of, of, of bad guys. Right, um, and they were getting they were getting beat up pretty good. So they detached our battalion and sent us off to Mosul. So now we're like, well, where is Mosul? And you're pulling out the map again. You yeah, know, you're like, oh, that's quite a bit different. Um, so we're going in there, and uh, of course, you know that unit um, is like, well, you guys take this side of the river, and we'll take this side of the river. And of course, you know, you're going to give us the bad side of the river. <laughs> and so we went there. And then our company was, um, you know, pretty good company. And so they gave us the worst part of that area. Yeah. And so off we went. And, um, and I mean, you went into it leaning on the NCOs that had come off of a previous deployment. This is my first one. For sure. And yeah. so you had heard things like, they're going to be ghosts out there. So you're going to hear a tink, 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 tink. You know, you're going to hit and then you're going to turn around and, and you're not even going to see them. And, and that made sense. There's, there's ways to shoot at people without being seen, right? And they kind of shoot and run. Um, so that was the, the idea. Uh, that was not the case. I mean, it was right okay. on to where guys would run out with, you know, RPGs and take a knee and shoot right at you. Um, and there was complex attacks where you would start getting shot from one side, and then they would come and hit you from another side at the same time, which is very similar to our tactics. Um, so there was, there was quite a bit more to it. Um, and it always had, you know, an IED involved in that, which made it really fun. Um, so it was, yeah. it was like literally, literally my first, my first rolling out of the wire, part of the left seat, right seat ride. I'm going with the other platoon and I get hit with my first IED. It just blows right over the front of a Humvee that I was in. Um, and, you know, it was game on from there. So I can go on for a long time on that deployment. It depends on how deep you want to go into it. But um, there was some pretty good things that really came out of that. And uh, so successful enough that I actually ended up writing a book about it and kind of helping to change tactics in counterinsurgency warfare based off of it. So, yeah, it was quite the, quite the experience. That's incredible. That's incredible. Um, and for, for all of our listeners listening, Mitch, tell us the title of the book and where it can be found. Yeah. Um, Amazon, uh, is easy, find easy find. Um, and it's tactical influence. Uh, someone came in behind me and also called the book tactical influence. So you kind of have to go off of the, the subtitle, which is how I countered an insurgency with words. Um, and so it was, it was literally, it's based off of um, yeah, it's kind of a, a fun story, but, but the long, the short story is this, um, there's a guy who's best friends, business partner, whatever you want to say with Warren Buffett, his name is Charlie Munger and Charlie Munger has this saying, and that is to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Okay. And so I took that to kind of change it to 
to the infantryman with a rifle, everything looks like a target. And so we know how to do the kinetic fight. We know how to like right. punch someone in the face. We know how to shoot somebody in the face. What we're not good with is doing anything else, right? So here we're going to be sent over there to win hearts and minds, if you remember that term. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but there was no, yeah, there was no how, how do you yeah. win hearts and minds. And so the counterinsurgency manual had come out, and it said, go live with the population and get them to talk to you. But it never told you how to get them to talk to you. And so you would go in there with basically every 80s movie behind you, right? Like maybe I need to hold them over a, 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 a building and say, tell me what I want to hear. And then they'll tell yeah, you everything right. you want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality of that is if you came into my house and had my wife and child over in a corner with yeah. guns, you know, on all of us, I would tell you whatever you want to hear. But that doesn't mean that it's intelligence, right? right? <laughs> and so yep. um, what I ended up doing is taking uh, other tactics and I just used words with it, right? And I basically did everything that I had done in the civilian world through sales and I used that with with people um, and, and literally uh, we countered that area within about a five-month period of time to where it was – strikingly different in that city where you're not getting and like we never got shot at again after a few months um that's incredible and yeah it was pretty wild like they knew which unit they even down to within our company they knew when my platoon was out and um would seek us out and so it was it was pretty wild um it was it was a fun time a scary time all the above right like it's yeah, it was a while. Yeah. How long kind of into that deployment? Because this, this was a very long deployment, 15 some months. How long yeah. into it uh, did it take for you to kind of develop this mindset or kind of take this different approach? Yeah. So we really took over um, somewhere in the first week of January of 08. And on January 28th of 2008, a uh, significant emotional event occurred. Um, it was not my platoon, but it was a sister platoon of a sister company. Okay. Um, had come through and uh, took a catastrophic hit on an uh, on a, 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 a deep buried IED on their home V. And uh, you know, I don't know how deep you want to go into that either. But um, I mean, I rolled out to that being told it was my first day off in three or four weeks. Uh, we had been going daily, patrol, daily, patrol, and it just, you couldn't sustain it. Like the vehicles couldn't sustain it. Yeah. And so let alone the men. And so it was like, Hey, we're going to start doing like, you get one day off every four days. And so it was our first day off. And it's like, we've only been back in for like a few hours. And all of a sudden a runner comes from the CP yelling, you know, Hey, get on the radio. You got to get right con one now. And so we went out there thinking it was a um, downed vehicle, like just like we'd recovered other vehicles, you know, yep. like with flat tires and things like that. And um, and so we would normally, you know, so I, was, I don't think I said it, but infantry company. So we would, we would sometimes, you know, take out like the, the recovery vehicles and just kind of provide security for them as they went out. That's what I thought we were going into. And like, a nine hour fight later, <laughs> we came out of it. Um, it was like a battalion fight. So there was multiple companies involved. Um, wow. It was, uh, yeah, you could Google it. If you put that date in, you'll find like, um, like we had to, we were taking fire from a mosque. And so we had to, you know, fire back on that. It was, it was a wild, wild day. Um, but it was that day that I was, I mean, it's in the book. Um, it's, you know, graphic to a point, but, you know, I had to put a kid into a body bag and that was like pretty significant to me. Yeah. So when I came back from that, I mean, I was just sitting there like shook, you know, and I was like, something's got to change. I mean, that was my big thing. And right. so I, I literally in my chew, um, in my little room with my other, with another platoon leader I shared, um, I had like a little tiny whiteboard and I wrote us, them on it. And I kind of just thought like, what, what are our actual goals? And I would just kind of write it down. And I was like, well, 
I want to win. Well, what, what, the, what in the world does that even mean, right? Mm-hmm. I want like guys to come home safe. Um, I want information. I want to kill or capture bad guys. I want, and so I kind of wrote this all down, and then I was like, them, and not like bad guys, but like the local populace. Like, yeah, what? Right. W- what do they want? Well, they want safety. They want jobs. They want food and shelter, right? Like, they want these some things. And then I was like, okay, so how do we connect these things? And so I started kind of writing that stuff out. And then I was like, well, I don't really know how to get that. And so I, I went back to a book I had read, and that's part of what I alluded to with the Charlie Munger quote. And so I went back to a book that I had gotten from a buddy. Um, and, and basically, it was think through with a lattice work of mental models. And what that means is if you were to go to a, an engineer with a problem, the engineer is going to think like an engineer and try to solve it with math and try to think through you know, certain loads of things. So, okay, that's great. If you go to an accountant to ask them how to solve a problem, they're going to think about it from a different perspective as well. So the point would be to learn the basics of a whole bunch of different mental models and then um, try to apply them in a lattice work. So if you think of like a lattice that you have, you know, around like a deck or something like that. Um, so I looked at the very first, what I just thought, what's, I don't know how this popped into my head, but, uh, I was like, what's the furthest thing from an infantry platoon leader? And I thought a second grade teacher. (laughs) So I was like, if I was a second grade teacher, how would I solve this? (laughs) Um, and then I was like, if I was a doctor, how would I solve this? If I was an accountant, how would I solve this? And so I started kind of thinking from those perspectives. Um, and so that is a very long way of saying three or four weeks into my deployment, <laughs> I changed tactics. That was, and so yeah, that's, I started, that's incredible. Wow. Yeah. I started doing things that I was doing in sales, um, back in the day. So I would go to a, so I was like, Hey, look, we're going to go to a, we're going to go to a neighborhood and I'd write it down. I mean, talking about, uh, everything came together properly. I mean, the guys were going to do what you had, what they had to do because, you know, that's the structure that we make, but these guys bought into what I was selling in a way. Like, so I was literally saying, we're going to go door to door to door to door down a street. And I'm going to talk to every single person. And so I would go in there and instead of going in there, like, I mean, I felt like leading up to that, if you remember the first scene in Star Wars when Darth Vader comes walking in, right? Yep. Like with all the stormtroopers. That's what I felt like going into people's homes. I'm sure. And yeah. so now I was like, hey, look, helmet off, glasses off. Um, okay. You could barely even see a rifle on me, right? Like I'd have it kind of behind me. And again, we look still scary. Don't get me wrong. Um, I guess stormtroopers have guns and Darth Vader does. <laughs> but um, so I guess I probably still look like him. But um, I would walk in and I would literally, I'll just take you to the story really quick of how this works because I really want this word out. I know we're talking to a bunch of veterans, but who knows who listens? Um, yeah, absolutely. veterans have brothers and sisters that'll come in behind them. But, um, here's how I would do it. I would walk in and I would look around the room, you know, obviously you've got the male there and then you've got the family over there. And the firstborn male is like really important in that culture. So I'd try to identify the biggest kid, right? And, and just notice something about him. And let's say you could tell he's got this, like, you know, snotty nose or something like that. So he's got the sniffles or whatever, probably got a cold. Um, and so I'd get his name. I'd get the, you know, the, the man's name, get the kid's name, find out what he does. Maybe he's a plumber. What, what part of the city are you in? Oh, you're from a different town yeah. or that you're working, that kind of stuff. And then um, I would, this is all mental. I'm not writing it in front of them. Um, and so just kind of carry it on and be like, hey, look you probably noticed that we're moving in next door to you. You could probably see where we're going in and they, everybody knows where you're living. And yeah. so they're like, yeah, yeah. I, I hear the machines out there, you know, and stuff. And you're like, yeah. So if something happens to you, it happens to me and vice versa. I want to take care of you. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's my phone number. And I had a little card set up with my cell phone number on it. I want you to give me a call right now. And so they pull out their phone and they call it. And then my phone would ring. And I'm like, great. Now I know who it is when you call. And I put the phone back in my pocket. And I'd be like, if you need something, if bad guys come after I leave, you call me. I'll have helicopters over your house. And then as I'd leave and go to the court, courtyard, they wouldn't come out. But some guys would be you know, moving to the next building. And so at that point, I pull out my pad and paper and I write down his phone number. I write down his name, write down his kid's name, write down that the kid's got the sniffles and he's a plumber. 
And so let's just say it's his name is Muhammad and the kid's name is Ibrahim. So then I do this throughout the, 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 the town, right? Throughout the street, I should say. And so then I would go back and I would go and type this stuff into my little cool guy stuff that we can't really say what that kind of system is, but it kind of looks like Google Earth. Um, and then I would, we weren't sophisticated enough to have this, but I would just bust out Microsoft Office and set myself <laughs> a calendar reminder. So the very next day I call him and I'm like, hey, Muhammad, it's, it's, it's Malazam is the lieutenant. So Malazam Mitch. Um, and he would respond, oh, yeah. And I'm like, hey, I just want to make sure you and your family are safe. No one came in behind you. No, we're all safe. Okay, thanks. Click. Don't ask for anything. That was it. Just hung up. Set a calendar reminder for two weeks later. And so two weeks later, that guy's name pops up. And then I call him back up. Hey, Muhammad, it's Malaza Mitch. I was just sitting there thinking about you this morning. And I thought, I can't believe I forgot to offer my, my medic. Um, I remember Ibrahim's nose was running. He probably has a cold. Can I send over a doctor to help? And they'd be like, no, you know, all confused, right? Like, no, I, I, I can't believe you remember that. And then it would be, um, you know, yeah, you know, I don't need any help, but thank you for remembering that. Okay, well, if you need something, let me know. You got my number, click. And then do it again two weeks later. And so now it's been a month and a day since I've seen him. And I call up again, and it's almost like, Malaza Mitch, you know, come for dinner. Yeah. Like, I can't, you know, they can't believe that they've got this, this interaction right. going, and you haven't asked for one thing from them. But fast forward three months, and I have a map, right, a Google map on a, a whole wall, and I've got certain people. I'm not saying everybody was that, but like out of 20 people, I could get one that was like had a good interaction with me. And so I'd have them on my board, pegged out with phone numbers. And now if something happens, boom, we see an explosion. In the past, we would get called out, hey, two clicks at six o'clock, smoke in the air. And we'd all jump in the vehicles and we start driving off. And Al Qaeda figured out that that's a good way to trick us into an ambush. Yep. And so now, right. right, so now I get to, instead of running out there, I get to look on my thing, two clicks, six o'clock. Oh, look, that's Muhammad. So now I call. And I don't even have to say hello. He's like, hey, two guys running down the street with an RPG. Muhammad, is that right or left out your front door? It's right. Okay. And now I'm clicking, you know, hey, yeah. to the guy, to the CP, the, the RTO, and he's like calling helicopters, right? And now we send helicopters and pin them down. And then we choose how to drive to them. And that was a game changer. Wow. Oh, my. Wow. That's, that's so absolutely a incredible. <laughs> That's absolutely so there's a plug for a book. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. a great, yeah. a great plug. I know. Wow, I wow. did. I, I didn't for... warn you that you were going to get hit with this stuff, but yeah, it's kind of um, yeah. I'm pretty passionate about it. So that's that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for taking us through that and taking us through what that actually looks like real time. So. You know, this, you know, like we've talked about, this was a, a very, you know, distinct 15 month deployment that you're on. You're a platoon leader. You would come back a couple right. years later and it would be a, a much, much different Iraq and kind of place in the war. Talk to us about that next deployment to Iraq, Mitch, and what that would look like for you. Sure. Um, I come back. Uh, I was the brigade planner at that time. So I was a, a, a captain. Um, and came back as the brigade planner, um, working in the S3 shop and, uh, knowing that I was going to take over an infantry platoon or <laughs> infantry company. Um, but not until we deployed, um, I didn't think that was a great idea, but that was the, that was the way it was going to go down. And so, um, like the day after the company that I was going to, the company commander that I was going to replace, um, signed over all equipment from the previous unit. I came and flew in um, to take over from him. And so I didn't get, I had zero, like, yeah, I really don't recommend this. I had zero interaction with the platoon leaders or any of, of the company. So they're all like raised up. They've been trained up over the last year under that guy and how he's going to do things. Right. And guess how I'm going to do things. Right. I just told you how I'm going to do stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I come into this and this is 2011. So we're coming up with, it's, it's the anniversary, right. Of nine 11 on the 10 year. And, um, who knows what's going to come out of that. And so I come in, um, 
And then shortly thereafter, it's told to us that we're actually going to end up closing down Iraq and getting out of there by the end of the year. Um, so the administration had decided that's that's how it's going to go down. And so we had come in there thinking that we're going to build up like a CTC, a combined training uh, center. So like NTC or a JRTC type of place um, for the Iraqis on the outskirts of Baghdad and a couple other places in the country. Right. And instead, we're just closing bases left and right. I mean, you want to talk about some funny stories. Um, but <laughs> yes. like, you know, guys closing a <laughs> guys closing a fob. And um, all of a sudden, just like, you know, Iraqi army and civilians just like, like swarming over the, over the thing to try to grab stuff and go, you know, and people running with TVs and people running with air conditioners. And the oh, I can only story, imagine though, what it must have looked like. Yeah. Tell well, us. The funniest one is a guy coming out, an Iraqi policeman walking out and um, he comes out of the defac with like that five gallon or three, I think it's like a five gallon tub of Baskin Robbins ice cream. And just <laughs> mowing and you know, just walking. People are running with things, you know, TVs and ACs. Uh, this guy got some ice cream. Ice he's, cream. Just like, he's just eating it and it's like 120 degrees out. So, like, <laughs> That's awesome. um, so That's there's awesome. some pretty funny things that come out of that, but um, also terrifying, right? Cause you're just so used to having the standoff all the time. Uh, so I came yeah. in knowing that and, and, and I'll, you know, if you can't tell, I'm kind of an open book here. Um, I'll, I'll tell you some personal things like the personal demons that, that jump out is I jump in a vehicle. I'm like, okay, day one, I'm out with the first, pat first patrol that's going out and we get out and they're doing what they had just been ripped towed with. They, they did their right seat, left seat ride with this other unit and they're letting people in and amongst themselves. So I came from this environment where I don't care if you're a, a, you know, I don't care what you are. We're pointing rifles at you to keep you away from yeah. us. And all of a sudden now it's like kids are swarming you. And it's like, it's like being a, a, a rock star walking out into the audience. I mean, it's just thousands of people. And my heart rate is like, you know, I, I'm about to flatline here. I mean, yeah. it's like, I'm about to go into pain. I'm having a panic attack. I'm just trying not to show it. And I can't believe that we're, you know, it, but it's a, it was a different place and it was a different time. Um, and I wasn't prepared for that. And so that was, that was, that's a shake it to the core kind of thing. It's pretty wild. Oh, I'm sure that so, I'm yeah, sure that completely had different, to have, completely different experience. What were um what were some of the other big kind of glaring differences, Mitch, from you know the time periods you know when you'd come back the second time? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it was so. Again, the kinetic fight wasn't there. We weren't getting shot at every day. Um, in fact, in the entire brigade, um, it was one of my platoons that took fire. Um, and that was it. It was one incident and, uh, in, in our deployment. Now our deployment was only what was, it was a 12 month deployment, but we only were in Iraq for six months. We closed the gate, um, at K crossing and, uh, which is the, the, the gate between Iraq and Kuwait. And then we stayed in Kuwait for six months just to make sure that nothing flared up and we'd have to go back in there like nine one one, if you will. Right. Um, yeah. So knowing that we, so we were closing down various fobs quickly and then, um, but I, and then it was tagged on me to write the plan for the, you know, so I wrote the plan to lead the last fighting force out of Iraq. And so wow, we, wow. we literally did that. So there was like a casing of the colors up in Baghdad and we were down in a, uh, I'm screwing up the name. I forgot it. What it's called. Diwania, um, in, in Iraq. And so People, you know, our guys had flown through that way, flowed through that way, I should say. And then um, we left in the middle of the night. We, we had invited, you know, all the Iraqi forces over for a Christmas celebration, even though they're not Christians. Um, so for December 25th, we were going to have everybody over for a big dinner, but it was on December 18th that we just packed up in the middle of the night and took off uh, and left. So it was kind of our way of keeping, like I said, all those those ants yeah. coming over the hill and taking air conditioners and ice cream right. um, from happening. But uh, I do want to say one other little funny one, just because it's funny. Yeah, um, absolutely. They had written, they, they had think of all these F one fifties that you see on a fob. And so it was like, just put roll. Like it was like, just put the, um, just put, 
just put the keys in the ignition and leave the door unlocked. And it was like guys running up there with, with, with their rifles and smashing the side window to reach in there to unlock the door. And you're like, try the door first. And oh like, man. They're like, stealing yeah. Cars <laughs> that are already unlocked. And it was, that was pretty funny too. So anyway, sorry. It was, oh my God. I'm just no, thank you. here. Thank uh, you for telling yeah, us about funny. that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to keep it entertaining here for folks. So <laughs> what, uh, could you notice a difference or was there any discernible difference kind of in the local population from that first deployment when you were there to that second one, you know, right. U S forces are getting ready to withdraw to when you all actually withdrawed. That's a great question. You know, no one's ever asked me that question. That's a great question. Um, huge difference. So the first time it was, you wouldn't even talk to your neighbor. Like people wouldn't come out of their houses other than to work. And that was it. They just stayed put. It was, it was COVID lockdown before COVID lockdown. Yeah. Right. I mean, they were terrified. There was, you know, curfews. Um, it was, you know, if you were out, you were doing something nefarious and you were probably getting shot at. So it was scary times. This next time, it was like normal-ish life in Iraq. And so people were out. I mean, there was parades and they would watch soccer games together and they would really? like i mean they were out there having chai and in, in in the in, in the yard with neighbors and it was kids playing soccer everywhere and like i mean it was it was any town iraq i guess i mean it was like it was it was um completely completely different Shocking. so they were getting they were getting back to kind of their i guess normal way of life so to speak yeah. Um, one of the cool things that I got to do is, uh, because I was the brigade planner, we had this, um, I had the opportunity basically as everybody was flowing in, as the entire brigade was flowing into Iraq, the brigade commander and I, just the two of us flew. I mean, we just helicopter float from, from one fob to the next and he would meet whatever commander because eventually he was going to be the commander. Okay. Yeah. And so we would, we would fly to all these different fobs and finally it was like, Hey, we're going to Mosul. And I was all excited. I want to see what Mosul looked like and, and how things were going. And so we got up there and so I'm walking around and it was, I mean, just completely different. I was like, I'm going to go back in the old CP. And I walked in the old CP and from what you would see in movies where we're just like, you know, radios out and everybody's tracking everything. I walk in, it's like almost like an MWR. It's still a, it's still a company thing, but they've got movies going and some guys playing video games. And I'm like, you guys ever go out? And they're like, no, we do not go outside the wire. And I was like, Oh, okay. And, um, and then, uh, as we left, we were getting on the helicopter and I was like, Hey, sir, you know, <laughs> hey, sir. I was like, Hey, do you think we could, do you think I could have, do you think we could fly over a certain part of the city? I just kind of want to see what it looks like. And that was my old AO. And uh, I was like, I was up here for 15 months. And he's like, he goes, yeah, just tell the pilots where you want to go. And I was like, we can do that. And he goes, well, I can. <laughs> like, okay. So <laughs> we, get, we get in there and I just put the headset on. I was like, hey, I want you to fly over this area. And so we flew over it. And where all these checkpoints were, like every couple blocks, it's just, uh, it's gone. And, and the 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 compound that we had taken we had bulldozed this um uh orchard and made that our cop and all this stuff. it was the trees were back i mean it was just it was it was quite wow. striking um and i still keep in touch with one of my old interpreters and about a Do month you? ago he was in mosul and he and i was like hey man like through facebook i was amazing right and i was like hey take a video for me and so he drove by where our stuff was and um, it's sad again though, because, yeah. uh, 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 ISIS had come in, if you remember, um, yeah, a few I years do. back and they yep. really decimated that place. And so it's, it almost looks worse than the worst that it was when I was there in certain places. I mean, it's, it's devastating. Like they blew up, they blew up. The, there was this mosque that we weren't even allowed to even practically look at it was this beautiful mosque they called it the jonah mosque or yona is what they call it but that if you remember the biblical story of jonah and the whale yep. jonah is actually buried in that mosque or at least that's what the iraqi imams told me and yep. we weren't it was just such this holy place don't go well freaking isis blew it up i mean it's just sad as could be oh, um so culturally sad. they've decimated that city and um 
yeah, it sucks yeah. because civilization was born in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia yeah. is, is Iraq. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember very well uh, when that happened, and that was really that was hard to take. That was hard to see. You know, it. it I think it was. Yeah. I think it was probably devastating to everyone in their own ways that served there, you know, right. Um, right. to touch back on, you know, you being a part of that, that actual withdrawal, right. And taking that mm-hmm. last fighting force out of Iraq, Mitch, did that give you any type of closure or any, I don't even know if closure is the right word. Right. But did that, you know, did it give you any type of peace or closure that, you know, we had done our job, it was time to move out or kind of what was the feeling for you when you literally did close out Iraq with that last fighting force? Yeah. Um, flying over Mosul did because it looked nice. Um, it, it looked peaceful. Uh, two weeks ago I was flying over Chicago and I was like, Oh, it looks really nice down there on the South side. Um, so, you know, when you're not on the ground, you don't really know, but it looked really nice. I could see commerce. I could see flow of traffic. I could see, you know, no checkpoints. I could see growth back in the, in the orchard. So that was kind of nice. Um, and then closing it down, um, kind of felt low. It, It didn't feel like good closure. It felt like, um, there's still a lot left to do. And we saw, I was privy to, some intel that was going to tell us that the vacuum left by us was going to be filled, um, not by, you know, the good people. Yeah. Well, we didn't know the name that was going to be ISIS, or at least I didn't, but we right. knew it was going to be an offshoot of Al Qaeda that would come in and take over that power vacuum. So knowing that, it hurt. I mean, we knew exactly what was going to go down. Um, I don't think we knew the extent. We didn't, you know, foresee some of that stuff, but we knew we knew a lot of it. Um, and some that I can't even really discuss, but there's some stuff that we just flat out knew and it was really sad. So I, I, I wish I could tell you that, yes, I felt that way, but no, I didn't. Yeah. Um, no. And still, and to this day, I don't, I know that I know that all of us that were there did our job. I know that all of us can feel honorable about those things. Um, I, I know that, with the hand that we were dealt, we did our, our, our job. But at the end of the day, it still lingers in my head for what? And here we are yeah. on the cusp of, as a recording this, you know, Memorial Day weekend. Um, and it hits me. It hits me pretty hard. Like, I feel bad about that incident, January 28th. Um, there was another one in October that hit a little bit closer to home as well. And, you know, those events were like, you sit back and you just know um, the second and third order effects, right? Like kids that were like babies, um, you know, spouses that, you know, they're missing parents, you know, brothers and sisters. I mean, it's, it's, it's shitty, right? It is shitty. shitty. Yeah, absolutely. Mitch, talk to us what it was like coming back to the U S after that second deployment. Um, much, uh much happier because i knew i knew that i was done with the infantry i was moving off to the acquisition course so i knew i wasn't going to deploy in that kind of environment again it was really hard going on that second one um the first time wide-eyed didn't really know anything and you know yeah. trying to test the metal if you will right uh, yeah that second one though um i was like having nightmares leading up to it. Um, I was, it was a struggle. And so coming out of it, I mean, it was like, like in, in, in my own way, right. Try not to show it, but I, I lost a ton of weight. Um, you either gain weight or you lose weight, right. Or you get like yep. built. Yeah. Some people, since we're, we are catch a lift. So let's talk about that. A lot of people <laughs> get up and almost look like they're on roids over there. Yeah. It was kind of like, I was the lose weight kind of guy. Um, and so I was really skinny when I came out of that and, but super happy to be done with it and felt like I had turned a page as far as, um, as far as whether I had to go back again, but never did it leave me because I keep in contact with NCOs and stuff that that's, that's the luck of the, eye of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, I 
sit there and look at the enlisted that go eight times and the craft that must be going through their heads um, is, and without being able to make some of the decisions, right? And so I yeah. have a lot of reverence for that because, um, yeah, I just recognize what that means and what that means to the families. And um, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering yeah. the question properly, but those yeah, are no, that Mitch, you recently retired from the military, from the Army, just last fall, I believe. Huge congratulations to you on that, and we thank you so much for your for yep. your many years of service to our great country. Um, what did it mean to you to retire this past fall? Thank you. Yeah, um, so this is my second time getting out, right? <laughs> this is my... Um, it's it hit me different than I thought it was going to. Um, I think because of the number of years. So the first time it was like four years, I'm done, you know, throw the deuces and I'm out. Um, yeah. Never thought I would come back. And so then um, now I'm at this place though, you know, it, it, I, I retired with 20 years. It took me 28 to get there. Um, and uh, it does feel like there's a little piece of me that's missing, right? Like I, I you know, I took the uniform off, um, I, I put the I love me, you don't see it here, but I put the I love me wall up um, of stuff that I've collected. Uh, yeah. And I'm kind of at this point, so it's been a little over six months. I'm at this point where uh, it's, 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 uh, I'm proud of what happened. I'm proud of the, 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 I'm proud of what I did. Um, it is a piece of me. It's a, it's an important piece of me, but it's not everything. And now there's a new chapter yeah. in my life. There's a, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up kind of phase yeah. um, as I near, I mean, I'm already middle-aged. And so, uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, there's a health benefit to it that I've, I've, I've kind of, and I'd really like to dig into a little bit with you. Um, but there's, it's, 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 it's different. Um, I'm growing my hair out. I got a beard as you can see, but I stay yeah. in time. I'm still institutionalized. I don't like it. Touch my <laughs> beard. It freaks me out. <laughs> there's some weird things, right? <laughs> So weird to go on with you. I mean, it's definitely institutionalization. There's no doubt about yeah. it. I mean, to this day, I need <laughs> to get, I mean, I need to get a doctor thing and I have to talk to my wife. I'm like, I don't know how to get to the doctor. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just used to just diddy bop on over and I know exactly where to go. And now I'm like, do I go back to the base or is there a civilian that I see? What am I supposed to do? Do I go to the VA? I don't really know. Oh my god! So I'm kind of lost. <laughs> those, yeah, you're still you're still uh, uh, you're still in the early phases here of of being out out and retired now. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little yeah. bit about professionally what you're doing now, Mitch. Yeah. Um, well, I had a plan, and so uh, uh, I had a ten year plan, and now I'm eleven years into my ten year plan. Um, I started a business just over four years ago um, doing financial planning. So I had gone out and got all my certifications, so the certified financial planner. Um, and so what I do is I just help people make better decisions with money. Um, that's, that's really the key. Um, I kind of specialize. I mean, I help people of all backgrounds. I help people of all, um, all parts of where they are in their life. But I specialize in age 50 plus. And I help them answer basically two questions. Can I or when can I retire? And then when should I take Social Security? And so, um, and, I, and I do that because, you know, my old man, he took Social Security early and that was, not a, that was a mistake. That was not the right thing for him. And a lot of people do that. And they, make, they leave, you know, tens if not hundred thousands of dollars on the table by, by, by taking Social Security at the wrong time. Um, people retire um, early or late. Uh, mostly late. They could have been, been enjoying retirement, but they think they don't have enough. And so they need someone to kind of help them guide them through that and talk through the taxation of it. So that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a money guy. It's it's the the fun thing that I've always done back through my entire military career. I mean, like it was mandatory to take my budgeting class, debt reduction class and investing class, you know, as, as a company commander. So I've helped hundreds of families, um, in the military with, with their finances. Um, but, and now I just get to get paid for it. That's tremendous. That's absolutely tremendous. And you've written another book to correct on, on financial planning. 
Yeah, I, I wrote another <laughs> Yeah, as I was writing that other book, I call that the real book, the tactical book, <laughs> the real book. Um, but I have, I'm not a writer. Uh, in fact, I, I I joke. I was with uh, – I'm coming up on my 30th high school reunion, but I was out oh, with yeah. a couple people that I went to high school with. And um, and uh, I won't say her name, but our English teacher that basically almost flunked me. And I'm like, I want to give her one of my books. <laughs> so I'm not a writer. <laughs> So I, 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 but I've seen the movies where you're supposed to get writer's block. And so as I was writing, I was like, I'm just going to say one hour a day. And so I would write for an hour. But if I really, they call it flow. If I was in the flow, I would just stop. I was like, I'm not doing that, but I'll start writing about finance. So I started writing a separate book and that came, well, it wasn't even a book. I was just kind of writing stuff for people. And it ended up being a book faster than the other one. It was just kind of like in my huh, off time yeah. whenever I was in flow. And so that's called If I'd Only Known about money then. And so, um, literally, cause I was like, I was feeling kind of bad about myself when I turned 40 that like, man, I wish I would have done these things when I was 20. Look where I would be right now monetarily. And it finally dawned on me that I could stop that cycle by finding somebody that was 60 and asking them what they wish that they had known at 40. And so please take that with you. And anybody that's listening to this, take that with you. Find somebody in your field that, that's yeah. older than you. Ask them what they wish at your age now and then implement it. And so you learn from their mistakes instead of your own. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to write a book for my 20-year-old self. And so that's what I did. And It's about money and it just talks through, you know, it's super thin, fast read, do it in one day, um, apply, Very you know, cool. it's, it's, they're on Amazon as well, or I'll give it away for free to anybody who wants to listen to it or contact me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm happy to give you the, the PDF version of it. Wonderful. Thank you for telling us about that, Mitch. I want to shift gears just a little bit with you here and get into kind of the other half here of all the great stuff you're doing sure. with your health and your fitness. Um, and maybe let's just start it off with that kind of as a general question of, you know, since retirement, how have you kind of approached your health and fitness? Yeah, I watched a lot of people, um, for lack of a better word, blow up when they get out of the military. And I was one of them when I first got out. um, I gained 50-some pounds um, over the course of those eight years. Um, It slowly snuck up on me. Um, But uh, And I've I've lost over 30 pounds four times now in my life. And so – and and as you get older, harder – and harder oh, yeah. and harder harder every time um, yeah like takes longer oh my gosh yeah and so i would watch these guys i remember this one guy i can't i'm not gonna say his name but um he was a, a chief warrant officer and very well five really well respected and he was already kind of blowing up his last year in and then he got out and, and then i think he had like a heart attack uh, within a year and i was like man there's nothing worse than when you watch these people put in I mean, they're putting their bodies on the line for the last for sure. years. Yep. And then they get out and it's like, they don't have a very good standard of living because of their health. Yeah. And so, um, and mental health, by the way, too. And so, uh, I was like, that will not be me. And so, uh, I got out, you know, it was literally like you said back in November. And so January came and I was like, okay, I don't want, I've run a marathon before and that is way too much of a time commitment and whatever. And so I was like, but I'll do a half a marathon. And so I started kind of Googling one of those because that would be an, you know, I need something to make me, something put it out there on yep. the calendar to make me work towards. For sure. And so I started looking into it. And the next thing I found was there were several of them in my area in Kansas City. And then there was one thing, if you do these three things in an eight month period of time, that's another race in of itself. And you combine your time and see how you come out. So I decided to do three half marathons in, in an eight week period of time. Um, I don't recommend it, but I recommend it. <laughs> it'll wear you out a little. Um, but I'd imagine that's that's where I devoted a lot of my time. Um, that's where I found out about about catch a lift um, was was just kind of googling like what's out there, and and then I was like, well, this would be great for the accountability part of it to help yeah. me make sure that I stay on the on course to do that um, because I'm really good at getting up at you know six six thirty PT. Um, but when no one's around, I'm not right. When there's yep, formation, right. I got to do it. But yep. when, now that I'm out, I don't have that. So I kind of needed the accountability, um, just filling out the form once a week. That's, that's, that's what I really kind of needed. Um, 
yeah, so that that that's what I've been doing, um, and and it's worked out pretty well. Uh, and then beyond that, I I, I stopped drinking. Um, I was drinking heavily um, pretty much since I was fifteen, <laughs> except for Army and Marine Corps schools. Um, <laughs> but uh, I really took a turn there for the worse uh, in the last. Uh, it's been about a year now, but um, that I quit. But but the year before that, so COVID is really where it became socially acceptable to start drinking on your driveway at eight a.m. Right? I yeah, that that, that was a part of yeah. Yeah, that was not good for me. That was the last thing you know uh, a half Irish yeah. kid needed. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. So talk to us a little bit more, Mitch, about your time, you know, in the Catch Lift Fund Wellness Program. You're one of our, our recent graduates from the one of our most recent groups. Talk to us about what that experience has been like for you and what it was like working with Coach Jess in the running group. Yeah, Jess is great. Um, she, she, again, just, just really encouraging. So like, you know, you fill out this, you fill out your little form and, and it's, you know, this is what I did. This is what I'm going to do. This is where I struggled. And you kind of just assume that someone's going to just, you know, okay, great. And have like a little quick, yeah, check it off, check the block. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Jess isn't that way. Just going to like, no, you know, ping you and be like, well, why did you feel that way? What <laughs> can I do to help you with that? And, you know, but also encouraging, you know, Hey, look, don't, yeah. look, don't feel bad. You did this. That's great. And so, um, just that, like, that's, um, that's not someone yelling at you, which is, you know, you know, what I'm used to, or me yelling at somebody else. So it was yeah. pretty cool to have that um, experience. And, um, and again, like I said, the accountability is what I really needed. Uh, so that was fantastic. So to just keep that, keep that going. And then there's, you know, the little um, dangling the carrot at the end of it too is, is pretty cool. So um, yeah, I, I was all in on it. It was great. I forgot, to wear my, I forgot to wear my cow shirt. <laughs> yeah, what's going on, Mitch? <laughs> I don't all know. good, all well, good. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm, I'm in a house. Yeah, we, we just bought a new house, so I'm in a, in a, in a different house well, than where my clothes are. Uh, I'll just say That's that. That's awesome. Uh, thanks, yeah. Yeah, so if it's Very echoey, cool. it's because there's zero in this room. <laughs> there's it's just zero empty. in this room. <laughs> it is an empty room, yes. So one of the other yeah. cool things you've you've done recently, Mitch, I know with your fitness and with your family has really gotten your daughter involved. Uh, talk to us yeah. about doing a run with your daughter and competing with her. Yeah, she's quite the little, um, she's a beast. Uh, she's eight years old and she just ran a 5K. Heck um, yeah. And she like crushed it. She was, I mean, look, she gets nervous around. I mean, there's a lot of people, everybody's old, you know, like, <laughs> they're like, it's like, that would make me nervous as heck. There. Good grief. Yeah. Man. And, and here she is, she's just, you know, four <laughs> feet tall and she's like looking around and she's like, okay. And they're, you know, shooting a gun and she doesn't quite grasp the distance. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. She's ready to take off like a shot. And I'm like, whoa, 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 pat you <laughs> back a little bit here, you know, that's pretty. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what's cool is everybody sees this little girl and everybody, first of all, that does a 5k is just trying to get through a 5k. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, except for the five people at the front that are trying to win the 5k. <laughs> so, so they're like, fighting for so the win. Both, <laughs> yeah. so, so you've got these people that are like super athletes and then you've got the rest of us. <laughs> um, so the rest of us look at her and then they project, man, I wish I was doing that when I was a kid. So they just encourage yeah. the heck out of her. They're like, you go girl. And you know, everybody's oh, high five yeah. at her and it's really cute. And she eats that up. Um, and, uh, and she doesn't know how to wear clothes. So it was cold in the morning and she's got like, I'm like, let's lay her up. She's like, no, I'm just going to wear this jacket. And I'm like, no, you're not going to wear it. So like we get like a half a mile oh. and she's like, can I take my jacket off? And I'm like, okay. you know, I'm like, yeah, I know. So I'm like, I know where this is going. So I'm like running yeah. with clothes. Um, and so, but, so that's pretty fun. Um, last summer as a seven year old, like last fall, I should say, she was seven. Um, but we did this thing called the wild boar challenge, which is a five mile long obstacle course. There's like 40 some obstacles. And she was one of, they didn't have a, you know, I looked in the rules, like, do you have to have a minimum age? And they just said parent guidance. And, um, so I'm the person that, you know, <laughs> okay, I'm not that guy that made the kid run, the <laughs> but, um, she did it. And it was amazing. Like she, awesome. she rocked it. She did every single one of the obstacles. Um, uh, 
uh, including the one where they shock you at the end. Although the person running it was like, come here, little girl, let me show you the angle to go. Like, to get She didn't get shocked. <laughs> I, on the other hand, got shocked several times trying to get <laughs> from being shocked. Um, but she went through that and, you know, again, everybody's high fiving her and, you know, she thought that was the coolest thing. And, you know, we're not the fastest people out there. We're walking a lot, but she's running a lot too. So she's into it. She's kind of like, and, and to me, I'm just like, give her the advantages that I didn't have, right. That I can yeah. put, put health in there. Let her like, you know, get running as it, to me, everything is like all these weight loss things that you see from the thigh master to the ab roller and all that is just like to not run. And cause running yeah. is the one yeah. thing that like does it for you that and rucking, right? Like put a heavy yeah. rack, put a, back on your but it messes you up joint wise and back wise. yeah um so if i can instill that in her um and then let her choose when we do it and when we don't and so she's found one called a minion run which is the minions okay um, yeah you dress up like a minion and you run a 5k <laughs> and so we're gonna try to do one of those um they got like glow ones and powder ones or something like that yeah they've they got so much fun stuff you. like that now right yeah that's very yeah, cool so, like, why not just get out there and have fun with it, you know? So yeah. that's what we're trying to do um, with it, just to kind of instill that in her. So yeah. That's tremendous. That's tremendous that she's a part of that, that fitness journey now on her own, but also with you. That's so cool. Mitch, yeah. I do have one last question I want to ask you sure. today. What does it mean to you to be a Catch-A-Lift-Fund veteran athlete? Yeah, um, I think it... it it means that you got to kind of help others. Right. And it kind of means like you've got the the baton now, once it's been passed to you, you kind of have to do something with it. And so, um, one, I've already referred a couple of people to the program. Um, awesome. and then two, to just, to just, I kind of think of it as like what I'm doing with my kid, right? Like kind of like there's the benefit, there's a dual benefit to that. Obviously we just talked about the first benefit, but the second one is again, it gives me accountability that I can't like slack off and I've got to right. keep these things going because I, again, I've told you how I can, I can blow up. And so it's, it's good for me to like, um, to acknowledge that there's, there's, I got a long life to live. Right. And, or I hope I do. And I want to do it in the, in the, I want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy the second half. I want it to be better than my first half. And so, uh, I think health is really, I mean, that's the key ingredient to all of it because everything's just easier when you're healthy. Um, and again, yeah. I'm, I'm throwing mental health in that part too. I know we're not really that kind of an organization, but I think it's important to talk about too. So especially Absolutely. veterans, I mean, we've got an issue out there, right? 22 yeah. a day. So, uh, I think that's an important part of it too. Oh man, thank you so much, Mitch. Thank you for your words today. Sure. That's that's Thanks it for, for this. Me. Oh my gosh, it was an honor. It was an honor talking with you. That's it for this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We will return next Wednesday at one Eastern time with another episode. Thank you, Mitch, for sharing your story and your light with us all today. And thank you so much for all your years of service to our great country. Thank you to ID Technologies for your support of this Coach's Corner podcast. Thank you to Lynn Coughlin, Henry Pomper, and Kaylee Nasiri for the work that you do week after week to make this pos podcast possible. And we thank the entire Kale team. Don't forget to join us every Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for a chance to win Kale swag and chat with your brothers and sisters. Until next week, keep it real and stay Kale strong. <laughs>